Welcome to the Rainmaker Podcast with your host, Guy Costin. The goal of this podcast is to give listeners a unique look into sales strategies from top industry executives. We introduce you to the heads of sales and heads of distribution who will help you understand the inner workings of the successful sales organizations from philosophy to execution. This podcast is essential for sales professionals seeking wisdom from the best in the field. If you're not familiar with Dakota and their Dakota Rainmaker content, please check out dakota.com to learn more about their services. This episode is brought to you by Dakota Marketplace. Are you tired of constantly jumping between multiple databases and channels to find the right investment opportunities? Introducing Dakota Marketplace, the comprehensive institutional and intermediary database built by fundraisers for fundraisers. With Dakota Marketplace, you'll have access to all channels and asset classes in one place, saving you time and streamlining your fundraising process. Say goodbye to the frustration of searching through multiple databases, websites, form ADVs, and say hello to a seamless and efficient fundraising experience. Sign up now and see the difference Dakota Marketplace can make for you. Visit dakota.com forward slash Dakota hyphen marketplace today. What is up everybody? Guy Costin, founder of CF Dakota. Welcome to the latest episode of the Rainmaker podcast. I am joined by Nick Wood of Bally Gifford. Nick, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much, Guy. It's uh, great to be here. My team are um, very complimentary about our relationship with you. So it's uh, wonderful to finally meet you in person. Well, it's such a thrill to have you on board. An iconic firm, right? Almost needs no introduction, but I do want introduction. And you know, Nick, one thing I just want to point out to our audience is that the reason we're doing these podcasts is that we live in this world, this crazy world of fundraising, mm-hmm. right? And there's not really any books like for SaaS businesses or all these other businesses. They have all these books and how-to guides and yeah. best practices and everything. And we live in this very sort of obscure world where there's really not a lot of public information about best practices around fundraising and culture and leadership and all of those sorts of things. So uh, why we do this, right, is to provide these insights to sophisticated distribution people who might be listening, as well as people first you know, day on the job as an investment salesperson. So really appreciate you being on. Yep. Nick is a client relationship director in the client's department and became a partner of the firm in 2018. He joined Valley Gifford in January of 1999 in the investment risk department, becoming head of the department in 2007. In 2010, Nick joined the client's department and focuses on our U.S. financial intermediary clients and prospects. He's also chairman of the U.S. Equity Product Group. Nick is a CFA charterholder and graduated BBS in economics from Massey University, New Zealand in 1994. So with that, could you just give a little, you have a very fascinating background, a little background in yourself and your firm? Yeah, great. Uh, Well, the the key to Bailey Gifford is we're a private UK-based investment partnership. We're founded in 1908. We've been a partnership through our 115 year history. The partnership is a key source of edge really for us. We are long-term growth managers. The partnership allows us to retain our best people, our best investors, and to really focus on our core aim, which is to find well-run innovative businesses, businesses that we believe are going to drive share price returns, in many cases, societal progress over the next five to 10 years for the benefit of our clients. In terms of our um, AUM, we have about $300 billion in assets, uh, client assets around the world. About $120 billion of that is here in the US. Our US business really grew out of institutional relationships in the 1980s, and then has really developed in the financial institution space in the past 10 to 20 years. Most clients here in in the US invest in our international growth strategies, our EM growth strategy, and some in our our global equity growth strategies as well. Now, you were kind enough to ask about me as well. Yes. Um, So, I mean, don't tell Bailey Gifford's other 1,800 employees, (laughs) but I simply have the best job in the office. Let's talk about that. Tell me about the job. Um, So I'm a, a wandering, optimistic Kiwi, a New Zealander who came into our came into Edinburgh 25 years ago, and uh, I joined Bailey Gifford at that time, and I've been there ever since. And and basically, I am a, a living, breathing Ted Lasso. I'm a Love foreign <laughs> I'm a foreign manager, and I get to manage and work with a group of highly talented Scottish, UK based colleagues and US colleagues here as as well. And the really fun bit is that we are divided by a common language, uh, which just makes the great the, the job a whole lot of fun. 
And we're all incredibly motivated to deliver for our clients over the long term here in the US. Yeah. So tell me about the uh, give me the size and scope of your team. Yeah. So, I mean, we're a very close-knit team. Uh, there are 12 of us, soon to be 13. Six of us are based in our, in our Scottish headquarters. Uh, five are in New York. We've recently uh, recruited an individual who's working from home in Denver. His name's uh, Connor Warren. And we're about to have somebody join us who will be based in Phoenix, Arizona. Oh, nice. uh, so we're, we're really going nationwide. Um, and we have overlapping responsibilities to cover everything from global and national financial institutions to RIAs, bank trusts, and, and multifamily offices. And perhaps just a little bit more about the history of our financial institution business. So yep. it really started a little bit over 20 years ago. We won some uh, marquee sub-advisory clients. So we've been a sub-advisor for Vanguard across a range of strategies that started in 2002. We also work with the likes of uh, Bright House and International Equities and, and Edward Jones as well. And then in about 2016, we took the decision to expand our mutual funds to introduce a KNI class share and to make them available on platforms. And that really gave us the scope to expand our, our financial institution business. So to us, this is a really fascinating space because client needs are ever evolving. Uh, so the mainstay of our financial institution business is sub-advisory and mutual funds. But we recently launched retail SMA. We're looking at active ETFs. And one other area that we've invested heavily in over the past 10 years is private equity growth. We are all about finding the next generation of entrepreneurs, of innovative businesses that we think are really going to matter and drive returns. So we've started to invest quite heavily in private equity space because what we want to do is find the next Magnificent Seven before they become anything like household names. And taking that investment in private equity space makes us better public uh, market investors as well. Well, that's great. So tell me, I got to get back to Ted Lasso. So I want to know about your team. <laughs> yeah. And you know, how, how's it structured? And give me your that style because now, I mean, I love Ted Lasso. Yeah. Right, I love his leadership style. We're going to get to leadership, but I really want to know how, how is your team set up? I know, I know you have Denver and Phoenix, New York, um, and and Edinburgh. But what uh, what is the sort of the construct? Are you do you guys do sales and client service? Like, yeah. how, how's it all divided up? Yeah, you know, the lines are blurring uh, between you know global and national institutions and and RIAs and financial advisor teams at, at, at wirehouses. So we do have overlapping coverage, but really. Um, we are very much client contacts first. So, you know, what we're trying to do is build strategic partnerships with our with our clients. We need clients to be aligned with the way that we invest, which which I can come on to to talk about. So, we are both client uh, contacts and business developers, but I would argue very thoughtful business developers because we need clients that are aligned with the way we go about investing. Yeah, can, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. I mean, it's really about long-term growth investing, and um, we invest, we're the most patient guys or people in the room. Right. Um, you know, there's a very, very strong link between earnings growth and revenue growth and share price returns, but it only really establishes itself over three and five years. So we're your ultimate buy and hold investors, uh, but that does come with a, a level of volatility. You know, we will tend to talk about hold discipline rather than sell discipline. Um, so we really do need clients that have the ability to invest for five years and longer to ride out those periods of underperformance that will be inevitable. And we think we can only really ensure mutual success for ourselves and our clients if our time horizon and our belief in innovation and technology-driven change are shared by our clients. I love that. So obviously these great businesses that you invest in, every great company knows how to communicate Yeah, internally. That's kind of the focus. Could you talk to me about the communication cadence, both internally with your 12 to 13 person team, yeah. and then also you're a partner at the firm, obviously, yeah. and how you report progress up to the executive committee? Yeah, sure. Great. Um, so, I mean, first of all, you've met some of my team. So Joe Stellato, Kristen Ross- are terrific people and they're terrific at their job. So when I'm thinking about communicating with them, the last thing they need is is me micromanaging them. 
what they really need is a supportive environment to help them do what they're already great at. So, you know, I think uh, communication is really all about culture. Uh, and I think if you have a shared sense of purpose, shared beliefs, if you like, then communication becomes quite easy. Um, so at a firm level, we have five shared beliefs that govern the way that we communicate with each other and communicate with our clients. So I think I think communication comes quite easy, even when, you know, in my case, I have a sort of a double-edged problem. On the one hand, I've got Scottish colleagues whose, you know, usage of the English language is eccentric, to say the least. And then I'm separated by the Atlantic Ocean with uh, from my U.S. colleagues. But I think if you've got a real sense of purpose and then you have a sensible cadence to your meetings, then communication becomes a lot easier. So both the Edinburgh and U.S. Half of the, halves of the team get together on a weekly basis. And then we get together as a whole team on a weekly basis. And then uh, we get together typically towards the end of the year for an annual in-person away day where we're really discussing what our strategic plan is, how we've been communicating individually and collectively with our clients throughout the year. Um, and, and that's really when we come together and plan for, for, the, for the future. And I guess the other thing, we're quite structured and disciplined about how we go about getting feedback from our clients. So we really don't leave that to chance at all. We do an annual survey. We get an independent firm to do a survey for us. They survey about a quarter of our clients every year. And what we're basically trying to work out is, are we delivering the returns that our clients need? Needs? Are we providing best-in-class client service? What can we learn from our peers, which is kind of what we're trying to do today as yeah. well. Um, and then it, it typically at our away day, we get together and we discuss all that feedback and we work out what we can and should implement on and, and improve. Wow, that's the first time I've ever heard of uh in a survey like that, that's that sounds like you get really great results from that. Yeah, I mean we've we've done it every year for, if not my whole career, certainly close to it, twenty to twenty five years. So, you know, and uh, you collect a lot of information about that time, and you glean a lot of insights about what your clients are really looking for and expect from you. Yeah. Oh, that's great. So, tell me, I know you're a partner at the firm. Yeah. And do you report weekly, monthly, quarterly, you know, sort of progress against your plan up to the executive yeah. committee? It, it's not anywhere. So there are 57 partners at the firm. Um, and, you know, the partnership is really built up over the 115-year the period. Um, the partners get together basically on a quarterly basis. Um, so it's far less frequent than you, than you might imagine. But we also have a North American management group that gets together quarterly to to discuss, you know, again, it's a, it's a fairly open-ended conversation about um, whether we're delivering for our clients because that is what we focus relentlessly on. Right. I love that. So the firm's been extremely successful. You've been extremely successful in your role in the client relations role. Can you walk me through your leadership approach yeah. and how you think about leadership amongst your team? Yeah. So if you think about what's made Bailey Gifford uh, an exceptional long-term growth investor, it's, it's the partnership structure and the 115 years worth of stability that that has provided. You know, um, could, could I, I wanted to ask yeah. you about that. You mentioned partnership quite a bit, just for the yeah. you know, for our listeners. Yeah. Like, it means a lot to you. Yeah. Walk me through just a little more detail how we should be thinking about the positive attributes of a partnership structure versus other structures. Yeah. It, it's really about um, I'm an owner of the business and I think about myself as an owner of the business. And all I am trying to do through my career is leave Bailey Gifford in in a better shape than mm -hmm. than when I uh, was fortunate enough to become a partner. So it allows you to just focus on the long term and all that you do in terms of delivering, uh, finding great businesses over a five and 10 year period and backing them with the patient capital that they need and in how you organize and recruit and train your people. So to us, this is a people business and the potential to become a partner means that we re retain our best investors. And what that means for all of our clients is that their portfolios are managed by people who know each other, trust each other, and have worked together in small teams for decades. You know, we think that gives us the best possible chance of delivering significant outperformance over time periods that really matter. 
and you, you know, you asked me about how I think about myself as a leader, what I'm trying to do in financial institution space is deliver exactly that same stability, quality, and commitment to delivering for our client base as we have on the investment side. So we've recruited really very well over the past 10 years. My job as a leader is to create a great environment to share my 25 years worth of experience in different roles at Bailey Gifford and to build up you know, loyalty and trust in what we're trying to achieve as a team. So I'll, I'll just give you one example. Please. So uh, a, a man, a male in, in my uh, New York office, whom you know, was about to have his first child. And he said to me, Nick, can I, um, I know what our parental leave policy is, but can I take four weeks off for the birth of my first child? And I said, no, Joe, you absolutely cannot. You, you should be taking six months off. <laughs> That's our policy and you're entitled to it. So we had this strange conversation where he's trying to beat me down and I'm trying to beat him up in terms of how much <laughs> time he takes. Because, And I think it's really important because what you're basically saying is we want you to commit your career to the firm, which means we need to be there for you during the most important periods of your life. So I don't view that as socialist or altruistic. I view it as you know, looking after your people and making sure that they understand that Bailey Gifford will support them when they need it. Because, you know, we all work very hard and we need a sensible work-life balance. And to me, that's what loyalty and trust is all about. So what I'm trying to do as a leader is demonstrate my commitment to each and every member of the team day in, day out, um, and help them build strategic partnerships with their clients. So one of the first things I do, so Connor Warren joined our team about six months ago. He's been through a sign-off process, so we now trust him to go out and talk to clients on his own, but we're not really going to leave him to do that. So I'm really here in the US this week because I'm flying out to Denver and Minneapolis to spend a week with him to introduce him to my clients that I've been working with for five or 10 years and also to help him start to build a client base himself. That's great. So two quick takeaways. Yeah. One is, I think it's brilliant that you've mimicked your sales process and client process that's the based end. upon your investment process. Yeah. It's absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Right? And that's, to, to me, that's, and then the portfolio managers can really relate to you all because you're mimicking what they yeah. do. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's, you then end up with, um, this is something that Ted Lasso might, you know, probably right. wishes he had said. It's like a circle of trust. You know, your investors know each other and trust each other because they've worked together for decades. And then they're talking to their client contacts and business developers, and we've been there for a long time. Yeah. And, you know, you hope you're working with the same clients for, for, for decades, you know, as we have with Vanguard. That's a 22, 23-year relationship. That That's what we're trying to replicate and achieve elsewhere. Yeah. Another, another takeaway is at Dakota, we have something called family first. Yeah. So as I always said... Um, if you miss a kid's event, yeah. whether it's a recital, a sports event, whatever, a graduation, whatever it might be, because of, of a work event, that's yeah. a fireable offense. <laughs> <laughs> so, because nothing is that, and unless the, the house, the, the office is burning down, yeah. nothing's that important to miss any of those key events in your life. Yeah. I do that because it's it's just the right thing to do. Yeah. There's nothing that important at work that matters that much if you're going to miss something that's so important to you in your yeah, personal life. Yeah, that's right. And I think people ultimately work harder and, and are more loyal in commitment if if there's more give and take. And you encourage people to to spend those crucial periods with their families, such as, you know, when they're having their children. Yeah. No, that's great. That's great. So speaking of younger people. Yeah. So- what advice, after doing this for 30 some odd years yeah. so successfully, yeah. what advice would you give to a young salesperson coming into this industry? Yeah. I mean, 25 years. 25 you're, years. You're okay. aging me. Sorry, so, yeah. sorry, and if sorry. Give it I was just giving you so many more experience. <laughs> yeah. So listen, I, I think the best advice is it, it, it's really hard work. You know, nobody's sitting there waiting for your phone call. So you really got to believe in the firm that you're working for and what you're doing. And I think you'll get a whole lot more satisfaction out of delivering what a client really needs over a 20-year period than you will from any individual sale. So I would say focus on that. Focus on building trust with your clients, building strategic partnerships, working out what they really want and need and what Bailey Gifford has to offer that will best work for them. I think it's that that you'll, and hopefully I will as well, 
that you'll look back on uh, with some level of satisfaction when when you're old and gray. Yeah, and you know, Nick, it's really interesting listening to you. You of anyone that I've spoken to has such a passion for Bailey Gifford. Yeah. And the company and what you all stand for and what you represent to your clients. Yeah. Both from an investment perspective and a client perspective. And it seems like that must be the case kind of through and through the company. I, I mean, that's certainly the aim. Yeah. yeah. We want people to feel like it's a firm that you can work with throughout your career. And, you know, I've been very lucky in that, you know, I, I said I've got the best uh, job of, of 1,800 people in the office. But I've done a number of things. So my career has developed and gone in surprising directions. And I honestly didn't really plan any of it. But <laughs> sometimes you, you just get a little bit lucky in, in life. So I started as a performance analyst. Um, I moved into our investment risk team. I head up, headed up our investment risk team. So it's, it's quite an interesting transition to go from the first half of my career where I was running our investment risk team to the second part of my career where I'm this slightly quirky Kiwi guy who's tasked with looking after our clients here in, in the US and, and building a team and building a, a business here, here in the US. Well, your passion rings true. I just want you to know it comes across and I'm sure you're not surprised by that. So as a distribution leader and everything yeah. that you're doing to help grow the business and maintain the client relationships, what do you see right now as kind of one of your number one challenges as a leader? So I think for us, you know, I, I, I mentioned at the beginning that that we are long-term growth investors and have been throughout our 115-year period. You know, we're always trying to find the next uh, decade of, of innovation and stuff. And that and that's where our history started here in the U.S., investing in in railway bonds and and rubber for um for for Model T for Model T Ford tires and things. So we're investing in the emerging market of the day which was the US 115 <laughs> years ago. So in my 25 years at Bailey Gifford, the most challenging period performance-wise for us was 2021 and 2022. So the the most difficult thing for us at the moment is our three-year performance track records aren't good across our strategies and volatility is high. So we really faced three headwinds in, in those two years. One was rising interest rates, falling valuations, and falling rates of growth. So what we need to do now and what our biggest challenge is, is to admit our mistakes, to maintain client conviction in how we invest. And I genuinely believe, and you could see this starting to happen in 2023, that those headwinds are becoming tailwinds. Interest rates have stopped rising. Our valuations have stopped compressing. Growth, rate has start, growth rates are starting to reaccelerate. And our companies have proven far more resilient than recent share prices would, would suggest. So I, I would argue that now is a great time to invest with a, an innovation conviction-led growth manager. And I say that because we are going through a period of unprecedented technological innovation and change. Right. You know, data-driven disruption, which started by, by disrupting advertising and e-commerce, is now spreading to the healthcare sector, to education, and to an energy transition. And I think all of this is just getting started. So technology-driven change and innovation is a great environment for a long-term growth manager. But the last couple of years have also been a very challenging period for us. So, so, so that's what we're focused on and talking to our clients about at the moment. However, it seems that you've done such the right thing in coaching your clients to think for the long term. Yeah. So when you do go through a very weird period for our economy globally, 21 and 22 in COVID and yeah. that's sort of that egg through the snake. Yeah. It's kind of this fake growth and then yeah. right this retreat. But you've obviously educated your clients to think longer term about your company and, and the investment strategies that you manage. Yeah. So I'm sure they've all been very patient during this time period. Yeah, I mean, they have been. You, you, we really are only as good as our clients. Um, so we need clients that are aligned uh, with, with how we think about investing and our time horizons. And, you know, we don't really have a sales process. We have an engagement process. Right. So what we're always trying to do is, is get our clients engaged with our approach to investment. What we really want clients to do is wake up somewhat bleary-eyed on the 1st of January after a big night out the night before and to be thinking, I wonder what great businesses 
themes and really interesting people bailey gifford is going to introduce me into the two in the years ahead and you know it's not about ideas for ideas sake it's about you know stock markets are driven by the few companies not the many stock markets aren't diversified it's really a few companies that achieve incredible things over decades and drive forward societal progress in in many respects that are the reason we all invest in equity markets and that is what Bailey Gifford is is trying to capture and then hold on to and support through patient capital. Yeah. Well, Nick, you guys have a an amazing firm, amazing investment strategies. And it's not a surprise for all the insights that you have just dropped on us of why you've been so successful in your 25 years at Bailey Gifford. So thanks so much for joining me today. Well, thank you very much. It's it's a pleasure to be here. And, and thanks for the opportunity to come here and, and talk to you all. No, it's been a blast. Your insights are incredible. So With that, that's a wrap of another episode of the Rainmaker podcast, joined by Nick Wood from Bailey Gifford. Thanks so much for joining, and we can't wait to see you on the next Rainmaker podcast. You can find this episode and others on Spotify, Apple, or your favorite podcast platform. We are also available on YouTube if you prefer to watch while you listen. If you would like to check up on past episodes, check out our website, dakota.com. Finally, if you like what you're hearing and seeing, please be sure to like, follow, and share these episodes. We welcome all your feedback as well. Thank you for investing your time with Dakota. Hey, thanks so much for joining Rainmaker Podcast. Hope you enjoyed the show, enjoyed the interview. I know I loved it. And hey, if you wake up in the morning and you raise money for an investment firm, you do cold outreach, whether you're a sales leader or salesperson, and you don't know about Dakota Marketplace, we would love to show it to you. It's world-class. It's used by over 880 investment firms and over 3,600 individual salespeople. To learn more, go to dakota.com and click on a free trial.